Can you tell us your name and the organization you're with? I'm uh, Robert Ray Pierre. I'm a chemical engineer. I work for a company uh, called America International. Um, it's a, a bioenergy holding company basically for a, a man who's uh, a, a contributor and, and a supporter of Global Footprint Network. And uh, the nature of what we do is try to find solutions for uh, a, a world where oil is depleting and, and that needs that a world that needs energy and real solutions, not solutions as a lot of them are today that are really dependent on fossil fuels because those are not real solutions. And uh, so I'm the chief technology officer for this company. Um, I'm, I'm here on, on a personal mission uh, for the man I work for. He wanted me to come and speak about peak oil to, to the conference here. And um, tell us about the nature of the problem. How do we know that we're um, running out of oil? Yeah, that's a very good question the, the, because that's, that's a misconception. The, the nature of the problem is not that we're running out of oil. The nature of the problem is that we have expanded the economy on growing oil production for a hundred years now, and the population has exploded with the growth in oil production. And we're reaching a point, we've already reached that point in the United States in 1970, lots of countries have reached it already, where we cannot continue to expand oil production. There's just not going to be enough. Um, you, the discoveries of oil peaked back in the 60s, and we've been producing that easy oil. And as oil has gotten more and more scarce, we've had to go into more and more hostile environments. Uh, BP in the Gulf of Mexico is just an example. We're drilling oil now far below the ocean surface. Um, and, and why do we do it? We do it because they, they do it because we demand it. Uh, we need cheap oil to keep the economy going, to keep uh, uh, the way of life that we've built going. And uh, this, this is the problem. And the problem is that a lot of China aspires to a third world or, or first world standard of living, Western standard of living. There's not enough oil. There's simply not enough oil for that. That, that can never happen. China can never mobilize uh, or motorize all of its citizens because there's simply not enough oil. But the third world, or a developing world, they aspire to a, to a higher standard of living that's gonna be very difficult because we've used up all the easy oil. have a concern with the solutions proposed so far. Yes. What is the problem, where, you know, and, and what role will wind, solar, and? The, there, is a, there is a role for wind, solar, biomass, geothermal. There's a role for all of them. The problem is that um, none of them are capable of replacing oil. The problem with biomass is there's simply not enough. Um, the, the, the efficiency of photosynthesis is only about 1%. So uh, the solar energy that comes down onto the earth is converted into biomass at a very low level. Now the advantage is there's a built-in storage mechanism there that we can then harvest the biomass and take it and convert it. But the conversion processes are at best 50% efficient. So from solar insulation to liquid fuel is a very inefficient process that uh, simply can't replace oil by any means. There, there's a, uh, a study that was done a few years ago that said that every single year we're burning over 400 years of ancient biomass. All the biomass that grew on the earth for 400 years is gone in, in one year. That's not sustainable. We're, we're well, well beyond sustainable with biomass. In theory, solar could replace oil but it's not, it's not there because there are no storage mechanisms that would allow us to take solar and then at night take that solar energy and use it to drive a car, for instance, or, or uh, you know, power an airplane. There'll, there'll never be solar powered airplanes. We will always need some liquid fuel there. So the problem is a lot of the solutions that are floated out there aren't really solutions and eventually they fall by the wayside and people forget about them because somebody else has thrown something else out. And it gives the constant impression to people, you talk to the average person and they'll say, oh yeah, there's solutions, there's algae and there's cellulose and, and all these things can replace oil when, when really they, they can't. Um, in, in theory, maybe someday solar can, but biomass never will other than a, a small, uh, it'll make a small contribution. And in, then in what direction do you think the solution will lie? The, the, the major solution is going to have to be, and I, I don't know any other way 
um, uh, any other conclusion one can reach, then we're going to have to learn to get by with a lot less. There, there's simply not enough to allow the way of life that we've built to continue. We, we can't live 40 miles away from jobs in mass numbers and drive back and forth because there's simply not enough energy to do it. And energy prices are gonna get so expensive and we got a little preview of that in 2008 when oil prices spiked up so high and suddenly people couldn't pay the bills anymore because their, their energy bills went up by $300 a month. At the same time, their mortgage rates reset and uh, suddenly they can no longer afford to pay the bills. And, and uh, it's a very, very uh, hard burden on many people. And I see this happening again and again. And frankly, that's one of the best things that could happen before oil peaks is for oil to get very expensive because then people will start to shift their behaviors. It'll take a while for people to shift. If oil peaks soon and falls rapidly, we have a very serious problem when, and really no solution. And, and it would probably mean a, a very deep recession at the, at the, at the minimum and, and a long depression at worst. And the company that you work for um, is trying to engineer other solutions. Um, can you talk some about those? I, I can talk a little bit about, I, I, I don't want to get into specific companies that we're talking to, but some of the technologies we like are, uh, are thermal technologies as opposed to biological technologies. Thermal technologies can take, say, wood, take biomass, waste, uh, agricultural residues, and they can thermally process them by, it's, it's almost like burning. It's called a partial oxidation reaction. And they make something called synthesis gas. And synthesis gas is widely used in the oil and chemical industry to make all kinds of things. And you can take synthesis gas and you can make diesel and jet fuel out of it. So one of the companies that we're involved with takes wood chips and makes jet fuel. Now that's in a, in a future where oil supplies are constrained we view that as a very key enabling technology to, to allow the airplanes to run. Now, again, there's probably not enough biomass to allow the planes to run at the levels they run today, but there may be enough for the critical, the critical needs and diesel fuel for the critical needs. So those are the kind of things we're looking at. These, these, a process like that has very minimal fossil fuel inputs into that process. It doesn't require fossil fuels to run and it actually produces excess heat, so it can produce some power, some electricity, along with the liquid fuels. And, and those are some of my criteria when I'm out trying to evaluate companies. I'm out thinking, can this, could this function off the grid without fossil fuel inputs? And if so, it's, it's an interesting, um, interesting uh, technology to me. Then the question gets into, is the soil depleted as a result of this? What are the emissions? How does it impact water supplies? So there's a lot more to sustainable solutions that we're looking into besides just the fossil fuel inputs, but that's a very important one. Yeah, and I just wanted to make sure I, um, to clarify something. In terms of the problem with oil production keeping up with demand, is that something that is a problem already today as we wanna raise large segments of our existing population out of poverty? Or is that something that we're talking about as the world continues to, as, as human population continues to grow? 10 years ago, oil was $8 a barrel. And it's gone up an order of magnitude since then and been well above that. And the reason is, and I've graphed this before, we had a lot of excess capacity in the year 2000. And as capacity grew, demand grew much faster, especially in China, especially in India, but the, the capacity cushion that we had, which could keep prices low, because if somebody went offline, somebody else could come in and take their place. So there were lots of producers that could make up a supply shortfall. But in the last 10 years, that supply cushion vanished. And by 2008, it was essentially gone, such that any bad news caused price to spike. You know, if somebody in Nigeria shut down a pipeline, the price spiked, any, any sort of bad news resulted in extreme volatility. Now, when prices got so high, consumers did start to change behaviors so that in the United States, we have dropped about a million barrels of demand in the last two years. The problem is China and India grew by almost two million barrels in that same time frame. So, whereas, you know, in the United States, we got in a little better shape, the world as a whole got in a little worse shape as far as uh, overall supplies. 
So today, there's a little bit of excess capacity because you know, so the, the, uh, the, the demand did get squeezed a little bit, but that's not gonna last very long. Um, a lot of projects got delayed as, um, as, as a result of the, the correction. After oil hit $147 a barrel, it overcorrected back down into the 30s, and a lot of companies delayed and canceled projects. And so that's setting up another price squeeze not too long. And, and the other side of the coin is $80 is now the new normal. I mean, people are accepting that, and that's, uh, that's a bit of a problem because people say, okay, well, I don't have to change my behavior anymore because I can live with $80 oil. Historically, that level has caused recession. And so we're right at the level that recession is, is, set on, is on set and we're still in recession. So I've often asked how we come out of a recession with oil prices at this level, with no excess capacity, how, how we ever come out. And um, just one more question. You had mentioned something the other day in your presentation. Um, that I thought was interesting about the fact that many of the solutions that um, have been uh, proposed and are being explored as substitutes for um, oil actually involve some fossil fuel <laughs> to bring about. Can you talk about that a little bit? Well, I'll give you an example of, of uh, corn ethanol. If you look at the energy inputs and the energy outputs of corn ethanol, more than 75% of the energy of corn ethanol can be attributed to fossil fuels. And yet we call this renewable, we subsidize it, we mandate it, and we convince ourselves that we're making renewable fuel that's good for the environment. When in reality, it's hard to, it's hard to even imagine that they could survive without the cheap fossil fuel inputs. One of their big worries a few years ago was natural gas. And I've got a quote from the ethanol industry that they were fretting the, the cost of natural gas as it was going up and how they were gonna survive that. And in fact, a number went bankrupt whenever natural gas prices got so high. Now that should be a warning sign. This is not really renewable fuel. There's a renewable component because corn does capture some solar energy, but it's also capturing a lot of energy from the fertilizer that we put in the ground. And then it's taking a lot of energy to move the corn around, to harvest, plant it, to bring it into the ethanol plant, and then to purify it. That all takes fossil fuels. And so we, we, we delude ourselves when we call corn ethanol renewable. It's slightly renewable, but there, there's really no guarantee that it could function without the cheap fossil fuels. Thank you. I'm good. Okay. I can let you go to it over. I hope I didn't screw up your sound too much. Oh, okay.